All right, everybody, we're going to get going with our YA panel. So take your seats here at the Spark stage. I learned this from Lars. I will be standing to look more intimidating during this entire presentation. Otherwise, I'll be looking at you guys through here. So I thought this was probably a little bit more, more comfortable for everybody involved. Uh, welcome to the Inspire Spark stage. Uh, we are here to talk about uh, YA literature. And this is a huge topic right now in the world of literature. I'll actually come up here, I think. Uh, my name is Kevin Sylvester. I will be your host and your MC for this session, which means I get to ask the questions. And the panel of experts here before you, I'll introduce them in just a second, get to answer them. And we will, of course, be looking for your questions as well. So if there's anything that is on your mind or that pops into your head during our presentation, feel free. There will be time at the end for you to ask any questions. The title is Amy's Marathon of Books and YA Literature. I guess a brief kind of a setup, and this will be my two cents, and you guys can feel free to disagree with me in a second. But the term YA has kind of exploded onto the public, public consciousness when it comes to children's literature. Uh, we've got, for example, the giant picture of Katniss Everdeen over here looming over us like a, I don't know, Twilight vampire poorly written with all sorts of bloodlust going on. What do you mean now, now? Now, now. All right, fair enough. We've had, you know, we've got everything in this genre from the summoning and the Hunger Games, for example, to uh, YA graphic novels uh, like uh, Skim or uh, this one, Summer. Uh, and of course, The Fault in Our Stars, which has become a bit of a, a lightning rod in, in the world of YA. So the questions we'll be looking at today, what is YA lit? Why has it become so popular? Why is it so loved, so hated, so misunderstood? It's kind of like a character in a YA novel. And we have the perfect people here to uh, answer these questions for us today. First up, Amy Mathers. Everybody say, Yay, Amy, our hero. She has lent, uh, Sylvia's already said she's her hero. She has lent her name to this session. She's been, if you haven't been following her blog, and if you haven't, do it. She has been on a year-long marathon of books, reading YA titles all the way across Canada, from coast to coast to coast. And it's all in effort to raise money for a YA book prize. And it was announced at the recent TD Book Awards that there is a YA book prize coming, right? Yep, next Yay, year. Amy. Next year, $5,000. Uh, and it's named after Amy as well, so give her a huge round of applause. Absolutely incredible. Next to her is Sylvia McNichol, who writes lots of uh, different books, but of course teen fiction. Uh, her most recent YA novels include Crush Candy Corpse, about a 17-year-old accused of the manslaughter of an Alzheimer's patient. It involves candy. There's actually a sequence crush. that goes through. <laughs> yes, a crush on a kind of a guy who's very hot and all sorts of other, come on, it's true, right? Come on, yeah, yeah there we go, absolutely. tells the truth. Uh, all right, Teresa Toten, next to her, uh, has many YA titles, won the Governor General's Award for a beautiful book last year, The Unlikely Hero of Room 13B. It was also the, <laughs> the Ruth and Sylvia Schwartz Children's Book Award, a CLA honor book for 2014. So yeah, another round of applause for Teresa. And closest to me here is Hadley Dyer, who has done just about every job in the book industry you can imagine, from bookseller to editor to author to right now she is working as the YA children's editor at HarperCollins Canada. She's worked with all sorts of uh, great authors. Uh, anyway, I won't get into all the details, but the bios of these people prove that they are the people to answer our questions today. So one more round of applause for them while I take a swig of water. Yay for you guys. I want to start off the questions with Amy, but this is an open question that I'll get every one of you to answer. Uh, and I asked the question even in my little brief introduction there. So maybe a, a fairly brief answer to a complicated question, which is what makes a novel a YA novel? Amy. Okay, so I'm not sure my what, okay, there, there we go. go. While I've been reading this year, I've considered that question because it is a hard, it's hard to pin down, but one day I was reading in Saskatchewan and I came across this book that just, 
put it perfectly. And it was The Death of Us by Alice Kui Kuypers? Kuypers. Kuypers. Thank you. And the quote goes like this. It's just, it's part of a sentence. When the world cracked open like an egg. And I loved it. It just clicked in my brain because it's such an apt metaphor for teen fiction. Um, each story is like the world cracking open like an egg. And as the characters find themselves dealing with new situations and greater knowledge of the world, their views change, they mature, and their lives are never the same afterwards. The egg that is cracked open cannot be mended. And that, that says it all for me. Okay. So there's Amy's view on YA. Sylvia, we'll just go down the, uh, the line here. All right. I'm going to disagree with everyone before they've even said anything. I'm going to add a Y to YA and call it YYA, especially in Canada. And I'm going to say that anything above a, a, an MG middle grade novel is now considered YA. And there is a reason for it, and, and that's because in Canada we're school dependent. So that our YA ends up to be a bit younger than say what trade American sales might be because we're so sanitized in order to get into school. So YA, as I said, is anything older than MG. So we're tween, we're not teen, you're constantly saying, teen reader, and I'm thinking tween, and then teen. Okay, fair enough. Teresa? I completely disagree with Sylvia. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Wait, I did have boxing gloves here. Biachi! <laughs> I think YA is absolutely the most misunderstood category of all the genres we have, uh, both in the U.S. and here. Some people think it's 10, 11, 12, which we often think of middle grade, but not often, not always. And then often it is, you know, okay, grades 9, 10, 11, 12, all right, maybe that's YA, but not really, because right now we're having adults reading YA. It is a mess of a category. I don't think as creators we can think of it truly as a category. Uh, and we're here to argue about what is that category. Okay. Well, maybe this is a good cue into Hadley, who is part of the people and the system, the system, I guess, that decides what's YA. All right, Hadley, what do you I, have to say I, for yourself? I, I am the man. Am I on? <laughs> um, well, we kind of distinguish in our list between books that are for 8 to 12, 10 to 14, the in-betweeners, and what we call YA is teen fiction, which would be uh, 13 and up. Uh, but certainly there are books that walk the line between children's and YA, and there are also books that walk the line between adult and YA. And basically the way we look at it is we think, well, who's the largest possible audience for the book? And that audience is determined by who will relate to the book. Because you can certainly write a book for adults that has a young character that won't resonate with young readers. Because it's, um, it, the way it's rendered means that they're interested in a different part of the experience, than the teen reader will. There may be layers of meaning that are inaccessible to a teen reader. So to give you just a quick example, Paula Fox answered this very question in the Believer magazine a few years ago because she writes for children and for adults. And she said, well, I would never give Anna Karenina to a five-year-old, and not just because it's long and a bit dirty, but because it's a novel about time. And what does a five-year-old know about the experience of time? She said, I wouldn't give it to a teenager, although a teenager could read it, and many do, and they'll get something out of it, but they too won't fully appreciate the novel. If you read it as a teenager, you should read it again when you're 30, and again when you turn 60. So for us, it's about matching that reader to, the, to getting the fullest possible experience out of reading that book. Well, I want to go back to Amy then, because you did a marathon where you specifically said you wanted to read YA titles. Given the disagreement on the panel already, <laughs> about what a YA title is. How did you maybe, what criteria were you using to pick the books that were on your marathon? Well, it is tricky. So Megan Howe from the Book Center and I took some time to discuss it and we eventually decided on an age limit of the main character, which still doesn't exactly work. So we went with 13 to 18, but you know, I mean, there's so many books I've read that 
We're probably more juvenile, intermedi intermediate fiction, middle grade fiction, but have that crossover, like you said, because it's, it's hard to just be one or the other sometimes. And then I also have the crossovers, like I read Miriam, T Miriam Tate's Irma Voth. That's definitely a crossover between young adult and adult, but it still worked. Um, David Adams Richards, I read him too. Again, same thing, because it's not, it's so diverse. It, it just, the edges bleed and that's just how it happens. Well, as the writers on the panel, uh, Teresa, you said that you don't, it's not something you have to concern yourself necessarily. You don't say, I'm writing a YA novel. No. But no. don't you get into a situation where you are framing uh, the age of your protagonist, the age of the, maybe even the complexity of the subject matter, so that you must know when you're writing it that it's for a specific audience that you have in mind. How do you, uh, how do you determine what's appropriate or inappropriate for the audience that your book is aimed at? I never think of my audience, Kevin. You never think <laughs> of your audience? The book is the book, the character is the character, what happens to the character and how they go from one chapter to another. I mean, I've just written a psychological thriller along with my editor where there are some extremely dark things that happen. And I was nervous about it. I was genuine. This is the first time I really thought as I was writing, but, 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 but. And my editor went, just write it. Just, we'll deal with it after. And that's been able to do that with the deal with it after. Uh, so there's so an far. internal consistency to your book that trumps any of those outside considerations. In my, it's not in everyone's case, but it's the only way I can do it. Okay. Kevin, can I just say that I write exactly the way Shakespeare did, and so all my protagonists are 14 years old to start with, because my main market is in Norway, and the girls' book club demands that the character be no older than 14. Once Norway decides they don't want it, and then I want to take it to Canada, then I may bump the age to 17 and then change some of the particulars. But there you go. So that's how I decide. And, and much, like, much as I hate to agree with Teresa, <laughs> we don't pander to an audience. We decide, oh, I'd like to write about this, or I meet a character. And that's what we write about. We don't, we, you know, we might go, I, I do often have test readers mm -hmm. to get clarity and to see what their concerns are, but really it's all about me. Fair enough. <laughs> Just like Shakespeare. Exactly. At Shakespeare, it was about the money. We don't want to, but, and so for me, I, and we're not. Yeah, exactly. I'm we not, would like to know. be, but we are Canadian authors. My Let's be honest. My sister here is about awards, and I'm no. Fair <laughs> I'm enough. About money. <laughs> now, Hadley, though, as an editor, have you ever had to say to a writer, "You have to take this out because your character is too young," or "This book needs to have this in it because it's skewed older"? I will say, I have had that experience as a writer where I wrote a book that I thought was YA and they said, take out the sex and swearing and we'll make it middle grade. Right, and that might be a publisher's decision to get to the biggest possible audience yeah. or because just their experience tells them that a 10-year-old's gonna get more out of it than a 12 or 13-year-old. Um, I'm sort of inclined to do as these two have, it, which is to say to the writer, just write it and then we'll deal with it afterwards. But there definitely are consequences to having certain material in each category. You know, one of my authors who has an American co-publisher had to take out the word crap because it was middle grade. We can do that here, they can't do that there. Didn't Should bother me. Shit in? Is that, is that what you're <laughs> well, saying? it's getting a little more swearsy than it used to, I have to say, but thank God for that. But I had an author I was working with when I was at James Lorimer and Company and there was a sex scene and I was like, I don't think it's sexy enough. Like this is kind of a big moment Ooh, in I the like story. It. I think you should ramp it up a little bit. And then she did, and it came back, and I thought, oh, we're in so much trouble. <laughs> like this, <laughs> the pendulum had swung so far the other way. And I took it to Jim Lorimer and said, it's really well written, but I, this is not going to get nominated for a White Pine Award. Or, you know, this could affect our sales in the institutional market, which are a huge percentage of our sales. 
And at first he said, well, maybe it can be more off the page. Do we really have to have sex in the book at all? And I was like, well, yeah, <laughs> except that somebody punches someone else in the face seven pages later. So are we saying violence is part of the teen experience, but sex isn't? So he said, and I've, I have done this ever since, he said, go to the author and just lay out cause and effect. If you keep it in as it is, then you have the story you want to write, but you'll have fewer sales, and that's your choice, and we'll stand behind you. So in the end, she massaged it a little bit so it was sexier than the first version, but maybe not quite as... Um, it's funny, I've had that whatever. number played on me, too. <laughs> if you keep this in, you'll only have, you'll lose 6,000 yeah. sales here. But it's, yeah. it's utterly true. That's the sad thing about our market is you have to get something past the gatekeepers. Mm. And certainly in, in the U.S. more than in Canada, but in, the, in Canada too, people are just not going to be comfortable putting some content, say, on the Force of Reading Award. I mean, they're pretty generous. Yeah. But, yeah. but even white so... White pine, no sex in white pine. And there's always yeah, a yeah, little bit right. of a language thing with The only wood too. is the white pine. That's yeah. what you're saying? <laughs> it's the, high school. What's your name? Of course it is. It's high school. I got to be on the White Pine Committee for So you're saying there years. is sex? Oh, yeah. I've well, have you seen Something Wicked by uh, Leslie Ann Cowan? Mm -hmm. We put that on the list one year, and oh, man, we got in trouble. I might not have <laughs> conveyed just how sexy the sex scene was. <laughs> well, how about you cite a few passages? It was 10 years ago, and I still remember every word. <laughs> That's good literature. That is good literature. I know. I ruined a good book. But, but part of this, I mean, it, but in, uh, again, I, I'm not just asking this from a marketing perspective, but at what point does the novel just become A? Like, at what point, like in an, a, an adult novel, you can write anything you want. But by labeling something YA, aren't you saying to the readers, the consumers, the booksellers that there is a certain, I don't, I'm not, not like a safe category, but that there are certain things in there that you do not have to worry about. I sound like a censor. That you do not have to worry about exposing the reader to, that they will not be surprised by it, I guess. Teresa, you're already shaking your head. Well, remember, way back when I was in high school, remember we were reading Essie Hinton yeah. and Margaret Lawrence and Margaret Atwood and Salinger and D.H. Lawrence more like yeah there was stuff in those books so and that got past the gatekeepers and educated much of this uh, well they were also homework. banned a lot too remember they were but they were also taught in the schools and if you're worried about that uh, I don't think there's a lot of that stuff in in my recent book uh, but the, it does touch on mental illness, and that, that has, I know, stopped some literacy coordinators cold and said, nope, not in our school That's because they're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but I, the, only, the only thing I am conscious of, in all honesty, is profanity. I think everything's on the table. Anything a teen goes through is on the table because it's the safest place to test and try out adulthood and experiences is in between the pages of a book. You can shut the book. It'll go in deep. You know, it can touch you more than any other medium. But I actually do, I've got to say, take it back what I said earlier, I will watch the craps, the shits, the bullshits, let alone the F word. And if I can convey that amount of power, anger, disgust in some other way, I really work hard to do it because I usually have enough of the other red flags in my books to not have two shits which will stop it going into the grade 11. But, but it doesn't sound like you're doing that as a filter. It sounds like you're doing that uh, because you would consider it almost lazy to just go to those default Sometimes words. Sometimes it is. I really do believe it is occasionally, you know, a bit of a fallback. Oh no, that's really what they would talk like. You can convey that without using. Now mind you, I curse like a sailor at home. So it, it is a challenge. I'm so sick of it, <laughs> Teresa. Seriously. Amy, when you were talking about being on the white pine, uh, obviously the forest of reading, if nobody knows the forest of reading, look it up. It's the greatest reading program in the universe. Yes. They're very open to allowing uh, Deborah Ellis books, even though they'd be fought against by school boards, because they say, no, 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 exactly what Teresa was saying. This is a program to introduce these things. When you were on white pine, did you ever have a situation where you really wanted a book there, but someone else fought against it? Like, is there a general culture out there? I'm not asking you to name names, but is there a culture out there of people who don't necessarily agree with the openness of the four panelists we have here today? Of course there is. I mean, 
you have a variety of people on a panel and they're all reading the same books and they're all having different reactions to them. And we're all coming from different walks of life. So I'm someone who's single, I don't have kids. I, I want a book that's going to tell a real story. But if I'm talking to someone who's a mother, a teacher, someone like that, then we have very different perspectives about what's appropriate for a teen audience. And my views might be more liberal than others. So, so how do you try to convince them? What do you say to them to try to convince them that they're, they're wrong? Well, you have to write a miniature review for every book. So I just try to point out what I like about the book, why I think it works, and then it comes down to a vote in the end. We have our phone discussions, but in the end, it's about which books get, some, get the most votes. Do you, do you not, sorry, am I allowed to ask yeah, you a question? Yeah, of course, go no. far away. I, I understood that the Forest of Reading flags books, so my book, Crush Candy Corpse, had a red flag, and that meant that the teachers would probably want to guide the readers, because mine has some things to do with euthanasia. Uh, so there was a red flag. And so they would know that if your school is really conservative, um, at the very least, you need a teacher guide. So do you flag in the white pine? Are they flagged? This has sacks in or something? Well, um, being on the selection committee, I wasn't really a part of that. Oh, so you don't know, right? I'm okay, not gotcha. sure. I know that. Sometimes the more conservative schools don't take some of the books, and that's how they deal with it. Yeah, they but just, they're forewarned, which is nice. Yeah. They can't help it. They have to deliver, like, private schools to whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Just, um, yeah. just want to remind everybody, this is a panel on a YA literature. I'm Kevin Sylvester. Amy, Sylvia, Teresa, and Hadley are here answering our questions. I want to ask a little bit, again, a kind of an open question. You mentioned S.E. Hinton. I read S.E. Hinton, Rumblefish. There was violence, but it was nothing like, for example, some of the books. Uh, there's a book called Grasshopper Jungle. Did anybody here read Grasshopper no. Jungle yet? Heard read it. Grasshopper <laughs> Jungle. It is fantastic. It is the rudest book I have ever read in my life. <laughs> it involves a lot of praying mantises and sperm. <laughs> and that's basically the plot of the book, but it is one of the most amazing books I've ever read. How I could not foresee that book reaching me at the age I read, read S.E. Hinton. How has the world of YA changed, developed, evolved, whatever, in the last, okay, I'm going to say how old I am, 30 years. Uh, Hadley? Um, well, in a number of ways. I mean, first of all, it, it's grown exponentially, especially in the last 10 years. So there's more titles, and then there are more sales. Um, the, the big books get bigger. The bestsellers are selling more copies. Uh, there's more competition um, among publishers and for, re uh, here's the problem. More titles, less review space, less media, especially in Canada. Um, but then on the other hand, you've got the emergence of all these digital marketing channels. And unlike with middle grade and, and picture books where you're going via an adult who actually has to purchase the book, the YA is the one category where you can actually have a direct conversation with the readers. So, you know, the majority of our strategy at HarperCollins is a digital strategy. We have, you know, we use consumer websites that are aimed at kids and their teachers. So Harper Classroom and the Savvy Reader and Frenzy and uh, Epic Reads. And we, you know, really use Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and all that stuff to go directly to readers. And we've got all these bloggers to help fill in the gaps where, you know, traditional Save us from the bloggers, dear God. <laughs> Double-edged sword. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> oh, not you. You have to read Amy's blog. Warning, this YA panel features violence. <laughs> But anyway, yeah. that's as a snapshot. That's it's, so it's growing hugely, and and also the adult readership for YA has grown hugely. They're quite a significant percentage of, of readers, mind you. They're mostly women in their twenties. I can't say you see a lot of middle-aged men sitting around reading Divergent, but that it. it uh, I'm not saying you don't see any. <laughs> you maybe don't see many. Fair enough. So yeah, there have been a lot of uh, changes, but then there's also all these new challenges. Does that change the topic matter that is available, given that you now know what so many specific people feed back to you guys? Does that mean that you can write a novel on something you wouldn't have been able to do 20 years ago or 30 years ago? 
does it open up freedom to the writers at all? Teresa, you're it shaking your head. It affects my hair color. <laughs> How so? Oh, well, they tell you on your website they don't like your hair color, so you don't... I mean, I, that's why I don't like the blogger per se. And, uh, so <laughs> Present company ex excluded, uh, ex excluded. But it's often... They feel anonymous, so they attack you on different levels. And, and again, coming from almost a YYA... Then if I get the 25-year-old or the 30-year-old, they're going to complain that my books are, well, they won't say it in this, but they'll say it's, uh, my word would be facile. I mean, it, it, it's not complex enough, it's not sexy enough for the 30-year-old, right? So that's, that's where when you cross over and you have adults reading, on the flip side, though, I think for a young adult, the market that we're not addressing and that is, is growing is the seniors. And they will love, and that'll affect YA as well. They can read the YYA because there's not that horrifying sex. I mean, you know, Fifty Shades kind of sex, not regular sex. Fair enough. Amy, you looked like you wanted to say something there. To defend blogging or otherwise. <laughs> well, she, well, I think yeah. I think if adults are complaining about your books being too young, then they're not reading the right books. I mean, <laughs> I agree. Your books are right, and they're not the even buying group. them. They're not buying them. They're just getting them for free to blog about, right? Like uh, dying to go viral is an excellent book, but it is a middle grade book, I would say, except it got labeled as YA. Mm -hmm. So I have my own problems there. Well, but, exactly. But. It's an excellent book that should be read by middle grade people. Death and intensity makes it YA, I guess, for the publisher and for the but schools. it's so innocent. I agree. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's because so I'm sweet. so innocent and sweet. <laughs> yes. They're just working on the blurbs for their books now. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jillian, you have a question. Fire away. I'm speaking as someone for whom teen books, when I was young, was Sister of the Bride books. They were before S.E. Hinton, and there was even one called Sister of the Bride. But uh, it seems to me that one of the big changes in YA is the breadth of subjects that are tackled in YA now, you know, sexuality, um, uh, you know, interracial stuff, being gay, being mentally ill. I mean, there's an extraordinary range of stuff that was not being written about even in the 80s, 70s and 80s. Yeah, would you guys agree with that? I think right from the beginning and still today, Huckleberry Finn is banned in a lot of schools in North America, as is Judy Bloom's Dear God, It's Me, Margaret, which I believe, as I recall, tackled both God and menstruation. And, that, and breast size. Yeah, you can't, you can't go there. <laughs> so that's still an issue. I think those books are still some of the, I've got a list of the, my 10 favorite banned books in uh, North America, and they, and I would read it if I could read. Number 10. Are we starting with number one? 10. Ten. Northern Lights by Philip Pullman. Nine, Angus Thong and the Full Frontal <laughs> Snogging, which I loved. Was that banned? Uh, Seriously? Banned, banned in a lot, oh, a lot sure. of schools. This, this has to be like banned in a whole lot of places. Looking for Alaska, John Green, he's perpetually in trouble. Yes, but he, is. he does not need our help. No. <laughs> Forever. We should, we should be so banned. <laughs> yeah. Forever by Judy Bloom. Lord of the Flies, William Goldring, must read in my school. Uh, the Chocolate War, Robert Cormier, I think to this day my favorite author of all time. The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Um, uh, the Dark Mysteries by Philip Pullman. And one of my favorite books, again, of all time, The Perks of Being a Wallflower. So some old titles, some new titles, but they are among the most banned. And some of them have been banned like for 30, 40 years, and they're still being banned. Yeah. So, I've always approached it as, you know, whatever is trendy with adults often filters down to young adult, or maybe doesn't even filter, you know? So... Um, I think actually it's going the other way around now, because the, it, especially coming up to the States, there are these major, major franchises, right? These, we've just come through a period of so many different fantasy genre, 
subgenres coming to the fore, yeah. and so many of those being made into films and made into series. And what I see around the editorial table where I sit with grown-up editors is uh, how that then makes its way into the adult sort of crossover market, and there's adult books that are dystopian or survival stories or, you know, whatever. Well, and even Fifty Shades of Grey was Twilight fan fiction, and that got booted right. up yeah, exactly. to, the exactly. next, to the next level. Uh, you mentioned John Green. I know we don't need to sell any John Green books, but I did want to get that because that was really, in a way, where in the general zeit, someone's torturing a dog over there, in the gen which is also YA fiction. When so in the general zeitgeist, that seemed to pop the term YA into general parlance. Suddenly, the New York Times is doing a story. Why do we read YA? Why do adults read YA? Why should anyone read YA? Just given that that was a Rare, very v large debate, and Amy touched on it a little bit, a good book is a good book, but what did you make of the controversy? Was it good? Was it bad? Did it highlight it, or did everybody kind of get the whole thing wrong? Uh, maybe I'll just start with Hadley at the end here. Well, I think, I mean, there were a few really high-profile articles that got everyone in our community very angry. upset, really angry, which in turn made them get more attention than they really deserve, frankly, because a lot of the arguments were frankly stupid. There was that very famous article by that woman in Salon who basically said, wouldn't it be terrible if everyone read only from the YA category? All like genres, data. right? All genres, good, bad, ugly, commercial, literary, and then never read from the greatest, from the literary canon of the greatest writers of all time as personified by Alice Munro. Wouldn't it be terrible if you only read this and never read that? And, and it's like, yes, that would be very objectionable if it wasn't so stupid because that would never <laughs> happen. That's ridiculous, it would never happen. Um, I have no objection to somebody reading John Green instead of Nick Hornby, if you want to compare apples to apples. Or I certainly would prefer someone to read John Green to Nicholas Sparks, no offense, Nicholas Sparks. <laughs> no, offense taken and deserved. <laughs> so, but I think basic, I mean, from a publishing standpoint, the way you know a lot of my colleagues and I see it, if I can speak on their behalf is, we have always been, and we will always be, a tiny fraction of the industry. It's a big, big world of books out there. And this is just, even though it's grown a lot, it will never, it will, it will always just be one uh, piece of it. And so for 40 years, when it started emerging, we've been fighting for respect, for review space, for media attention, for recognition. And now a handful of adults, mostly young women, are saying, hey, this is actually, there's some good stories to be had here. I think I'll read them alongside my Alice Munro. And suddenly all these people are raising a red flag going, oh my God, the teens are coming. The teens are coming. You know, they're going to kill Alice, which, you know, they won't because they can't. And she, you know, she fights dirty. Everyone knows that. <laughs> So I just want to say to those people, just kind of like, just sit down, sit down and give us a minute because we've been waiting four decades for it. And, you know, stop saying the sky is falling just because there are a few more good books to read. We've just pulled up a few chairs. That's, that's all. Would you agree? Sylvia, Sylvia you look like you're going to jump in there. Well, um, I, cause you, you gave, you gave us all questions that you're not even saying, but, um, I said this conversation would be organic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, here we go, organic. Um, the, uh, I've been, you know, informally interviewing people and saying, why do you read YA and, and, and why, what do you enjoy? And some people have said things like, uh, they don't follow a genre, they follow a ca uh, an author. Uh, but my gut feeling is that when I end a book, I do not want to wrap it up, but I want the reader to go, Hmm. So, okay, hmm. Now, when you read an adult book and you spend 600 pages reading an adult book and you're engrossed in the character, at the end, let's face it, do you go, hmm, or do you go, huh? So, the way I think is uh, people want a stronger story. They want to go, hmm, not, huh. And by the way, they want shorter. They do not want to, well, okay, Harry Potter accepting. I think. People want quicker reads for the subway. They're watching YouTubes. They have the attention span of a gnat. So they want YA, for sure. Interesting. Uh, Amy, did you or Teresa want to jump in on just maybe the, the, that thread? Well, or? well, one of the things I've been encountering is, one of the questions I get is, what are you going to read after? 
after you're finally done with YA. Like this year has been... I just asked her that before. Sandra, I love YA. It's just, it's in me. I do not like adult books that much. I read them once in a while, if I have to. But after this is done, I will still be reading YA because that's what I like. And I don't feel ashamed of it, even though with the articles that have come out, I feel like, oh, maybe I should be ashamed of this. But with the exception of one or two titles, like um, one of the books I read was called My Parents Are Sex Maniacs <laughs> by Robin Harding, I think. And so that one I was a little embarrassed reading on the subway. But other than that, I think Use I'd your be... your e-reader. <laughs> I'd be more embarrassed reading Fifty Shades of Grey on the subway. So, yeah, I'm... There's a whole world of crappy adult books out there. <laughs> yes, there are. And I really resent that, like, Governor General's award winners have to, s to defend themselves, you know, against this when there's just, there's a world, there are hundreds of thousands of really badly written books, even those that are called literary books. And the, the notion that, you, first of all, the notion you have to choose is silly to begin with because nobody has to choose. Read everything. You can read everything yeah. if you want to. Exactly. But it's, it's really the people who raise those questions are those who don't read a lot of YA who, or they're not finding the YA they want. And I think it's just not, to me, I'm sort of exhausted to the point of I don't want to engage with them anymore because they're not our tribe. Like, <laughs> they're not our people. We're so We don't need them. Here. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to change their minds. It doesn't matter. It yeah. doesn't matter. Tracy? I didn't know when I started writing that I was going to be a YA writer. I, you know, the categories didn't, weren't that firm in my head. Now that I am a YA writer in this moment, I think it's the most exciting time in the history of the past 40 years to be a YA writer. I think the exciting part of all the crap that's going around, the clickbaiting on uh, these outrageous articles means that we're big enough boys that we're attracting attention. We're getting more notice out there. There's going to be a few stones thrown. There'll be thrown stones back defending us. And I think actually that that is exciting and enervating and it's just a fantastic time to be writing for young people. Cool. Can I ask uh, something? I think Hadley said something that, that tweaked something in my brain. Is part of the running down of YA Lit that it is often young women readers? In other words, that there is a oh, kind of a suggested, this isn't serious because it's being read by young women. And, and we see this in our larger culture. Is that part of why do you think YA has to fight that stigma? Is that it's seen as young women's literature? Actually, Amy's already got the mic up, so go, Amy. <laughs> uh, well, I would say, like, the denigration of chick lit in general. Yeah, and I think that's part of why YA, that's my question, is that part of why YA is shoved to the side and seen as... as on the, on the sidelines in some ways. Wow, I never really thought of it that way, but I, yeah, I can see what you're talking about. Cool. It's a little unsettling, thanks for bringing it up. Sorry. <laughs> it just was occurring to me as you were describing it. No, I it. think you, you think you're onto something, actually. And people don't, you know, it's, but you see this in all kinds of writing. If somebody is a beautiful short story writer, what's the first question they get asked? When are you gonna write a novel? Like a marathoner could ever be an Olympic class sprinter. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? They're just, if you are a playwright, when are you gonna write a screenplay? If you write children's books, when are you gonna graduate to YA or adult? And it really just comes from a lack of appreciation about the form that, you know, things can be simple to write, but difficult to write. You know, people have to, they have to write what they're going to write. And um, there's this really weird defensiveness that people have, both as it as as readers and as writers, that crops up because there are just a ton. There's a world of people out there who are going to make assumptions about how easy or unsophisticated it is that, you, and we just have to carry on because it has actually always been like this, really, hasn't it? So, carry on. Do you know, Kevin? You when you mentioned controversy over John Green's *The Fault in Our Stars*, I googled because I. I'm asleep, I'm just in my own world. I didn't even know there was a controversy. The controversy I found was there was a tagline over the movie that came out, yeah. and it was a sick romance. And people did were offended by that term. And now here is what happens when you have older people in the YA market. Well, sick 
anybody who knows kids is used in a different way. Sometimes sick is meant to be very fantastic. And of course, the two characters, the main characters, are uh, terminally ill, so they are sick. It's a double entendre that the adults, uh, I don't know, they saw red when they saw this. And, and that's sometimes what the YA writer has to fight. The terminology that you use to get to kids doesn't work on the adults. Uh, just because Sylvia was yelling at me for not sticking to the script. Oh dear, Sylvia. I, I did, you know, oh no. Sylvia, you are often asked how you can write from a teen perspective. Oh. And this is a question about that voice you're talking about and about authenticity and lingo and stuff. How do you, not being a teenager, find that voice in your writing? And this would be, I guess, you well, know certainly what? for all the writers. I don't find that voice. Uh, I write in my natural style. Um, just like Teresa, I swear like a truck driver when I'm talking to her. But in my books, I, anything you do in a book validates it. So if you write that a six year, uh, grade six gives blowjobs in the field, you are validating that by putting it in your story. So I will not do that. Um, so that uh, to capture the teen voice, I just write as clearly as possible. I use a lot of dialogue. And when a, when a young person identifies with my first person character, so often when you write first person, the, the reader has to jump into that character. And if they fail to, then the book fails for them. But my fans who really like my work will immediately say, when you, when you talk, it's like it comes right out of my head. It doesn't because I don't swear. I do not use that question marky tone at the end of a sentence. I use an approximation of the way a young person talks. And I emphasize I'm more about being a clear writer. If I, re I will read out loud to test that it's clear. So I'm not about trying to get the right, uh, I don't know, the, the uh, vernacular of the day necessarily. I, as writers, we all have to be careful not to fall behind because we're buried in our work and we don't see technology or whatever. That has to be embraced. You have to embrace today's reality in your story, but I don't give the exact voice. That said, I text my 13-year-old grandson every day, and I say, do you know what Mr. Clean is? And then he asks his friends, and they do or they don't, so. Fair enough, so the authenticity comes from research. Somewhat. Hard research. <laughs> Teresa, it's very I, easy. Teresa, I know it's interesting to read the Q&A at the end of 13B, for example. And there is, you're writing about Adam, who's got uh, mental health issues, OC, you know, obsessive compulsive. Is it? Is it weird to have people, this is not even necessarily a YA question, is it weird to have people assume that your OC, you know, DC, sorry, my brain flipped there. The whole industry <laughs> knows. Yeah. The yeah. whole industry it's knows. It's an open secret. Yeah, okay, Teresa. <laughs> but is that part of the challenge, too, to try to find a way to find a voice that might not necessarily be inside you? I was a 15-year-old OCD boy as I wrote that. There is, like, you would not have wanted to be around me. <laughs> a year and a half, or plus I'm a slow writer, uh, while I was working out that voice. And it's, uh, I read everything, just about every other sentence, and then every third sentence, and then all the three sentences I wrote as I'm walking around the house, I'm talking the dialogue, I'm acting the dialogue. It's, you would laugh your head off <laughs> to see the process <laughs> at work. But I become, as best I could, I became a 15-year-old boy with severe debilitating anxiety issues. I found myself uh, reading it every time I approached a door, getting very nervous. <laughs> but because it's true, that's, that's the authenticity of his voice, is that you feel, like you said, you jump into that character. You must have that experience when you're reading a book, right, Amy? Like, oh, yes. And actually, since I'm reading a book a day, it helps that I'm also writing a review and a blog post a day because... It just helps me process what I've read and, and get it out so that next I'm ready for the next day and the next book and the next idea. Cool. Does anybody in the audience have a question that they would like to ask our panelists? Anything at all? Anything. There, Vicky at the back. <laughs> Hello. 
Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to know, since you're such YA crusaders, what YA book would you recommend to someone who's never read a, an adult, who's not yet any read any YA at all? So a title that you think would be a good introduction to YA. Teresa's book, definitely. <laughs> Won the GG. Well, how could you go wrong? I think uh, those crossover books are a good way to, to uh, hook them in. And, and uh, uh, like A Complicated Kindness, which you mentioned, I think if you, so you could fool them uh, a little bit. I mean, there's the books that I know that I lo love, but um, uh, there's something about the way a book is packaged that sometimes can be a little bit helpful if you have a reluctant adult reader who you <laughs> want to encourage. I love that book. I would say if you're trying to get hook uh, the male reader, because we were talking about uh, it being a girl kind of thing. Honest to God, Robert Cormier's Start with the Chocolate War, Brian Doyle's books, you know, very, very male, profound, and perfectly written. Actually, I think Teresa and Hadley are right. Like, yes, fool them <laughs> into going like, a lot of the classics we have, Canadian classics, are YA, but not packaged that way. So I read Anne of Green Gables. I read Who Has Seen the Wind. I read Brian Doyle. And I personally didn't get Brian Doyle. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> well, it depends which one. Like French Fry Wars was good. Yeah. I didn't read that one. Ah. But yeah, I would say... You can read it with the Chocolate Wars and get a whole yeah. meal. Yeah, <laughs> get a fix. Yeah. Those are the books, because it's hard... The other thing about YA is that it covers all the genres, too. So you have to look at who you're talking to, what they're interested in, before you can recommend a good YA novel. But there are tons. Yeah. Cool. Grasshopper Jungle. <laughs> it's a great book. And The Chocolate Wars is referenced in it as well. Oh. Uh, any other questions? Anybody have anything they would like to ask our panelists? Okay, can I ask one more question before we go? Because we have a couple questions. You all touched a little bit on the idea that uh, Sylvia started off by saying that in Canada we have a different kind of YA literature. Is there a distinctly Canadian YA lit? Amy, I'll start with you and then we'll just go down the panel. Yes. How? How? Okay. So I've been going province by province. I've read through the territories. Each province and, territories, and territory has a distinctive flavor. And each one has a sort of theme. So, for example, Newfoundland was mainly about cod fishing. And then Nova Scotia was about coal mining. And then PEI you almost can't read a PEI book without it referencing Anne of Green Gables in some way. <laughs> so, and then Quebec was kind of the pioneers, the settlers, and a lot about religion, which was interesting. Uh, Ontario, I spent four months in Ontario, so it's kind of hard to condense it. But there is a greater appreciation for, I would say, immigration stories. So that's what I found for Ontario. And then Manitoba is about the community and the land. And then Saskatchewan really surprised me. It was about farming, but it was also about these amazing existential <laughs> quandaries. And book after book, it was just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Nunavut was about survival against the elements. Uh, Northwest Territories is more complicated, some survival, some other stuff going on. And then Yukon, the gold rush, and also the vast, beautiful land they have. Huh. And BC, I'm still working it out because BC's I BC's books are about not being from Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes, I would say it's distinctive, and like you said in your questions, I've read books from Canada and international books. And I do think that there is a specific Canadian flavor to our books. And I think it focuses on our life on the land 
our life with uh, our resources. And it also has to do with the fact that we have such an incredible world view. So I've been reading my way across Canada, but I've also been reading my way across the world because our authors are so diverse and they just dig into all kinds of topics and make them come alive. Cool. That's now we're amazing. almost at a time, but it, d d would you guys like to jump in as well on that? Well, uh, I would just say um, I think we award winners are edgier and then school books that in the school are gentler. So I think Canadian YA is oh, edgier in a, in, in a sense compared to what I can write for Norway and what, what is wanted here. Hmm. Okay, Teresa? Uh, we have gatekeepers, and you'd think that would make our publishers pause more because we are far more dependent on schools and literacy coordinators and teacher librarians than is the U.S., major form of the market, but you can sell a whole lot of books in the U.S. without you know, going through the teacher librarians. And still, I think we write more honestly and openly and honest to God, I think we write better. Cool. Have it. Well, I just, I think we have a more diverse list of books that come mm -hmm. out culturally and in terms of the topics that we will tackle. And I think you're right. I think we're, we're bolder. I mean, we, we didn't hesitate to publish a book recently about, from, by Maggie DeVries about sex, drug abuse, and child prostitution. I mean, we just did it. And Rabbit ears. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. and which she was a really important book to do, and actually we've exported it uh, into the U.S. where it's, it's yeah, that, which has been great. But so I think that's all true. But we also, in, I think we're a bit insulated from market trends, from market mm -hmm. forces. The we don't have a lot of huge, big blockbuster YA series here, which in a way is too bad because if we did, that would help underwrite the quieter the stories, <laughs> which is nice. But, um, and I think part of this is not only because of our boldness and our commitment to good writing, I think it's also um, in part because uh, with a small pool of writers, you don't have the luxury to walk away from good writing. And I also think the public funding that we uh, have given to the independents over 40 years is specifically designed to protect them from market forces. And so even publishing companies like HarperCollins or Penguin or Simon & Schuster, which are not eligible for that funding benefit from it because we never gave up on realistic fiction, which disappeared from the U.S. for three years. We never gave up on historical fiction, and we never gave up on tough stories. And believe me, I saw lots of editors in New York who couldn't say the same thing. They simply couldn't acquire that stuff. Okay. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody for coming to listen to our panel today. Uh, thank our panelists, Amy Mather, Sylvia McDickel, uh, Teresa Toten, and Hadley Dyer. Uh, thanks as well to the Canadian Children's Book Center for helping to put this together. Uh, we're all going to be mingling around. If you do have any other questions, we're you signing can track over us there now. too. Yeah, right signing now. over there, right over there. Yeah, over there, we're signing. Right over there, we're, we're being waved Come at chat. right now. So thank you guys very, very much, and a big round of applause for our panelists today.